I think you are probably the, the, the most prolific writer of our, of our time. Um, he's written the 48 Laws of Power, uh, the Mastery, the, I mean, it, the list goes on and on. Like, I mean, and his late, latest book is the, Law, the Laws of Human Nature. And I was just saying before we started rolling that like each one of your books could actually just be like your swan song. And then, you know, you can just call it a day, call it a day. But like the reality is like there's every single one of these books is epic. Like the amount of care and time and detail, it's like it, it's it's impossible to get through as a reader, never mind like as a writer of it. I mean, yeah. do you hear that like all the time? I, I hear it. Yeah, yeah. It makes me feel very good. Because, you know, there's a lot of pain and effort that goes into the book, but you get the satisfaction when people tell you stories like that or that they respond to how much work and effort. Because, you know, one of the laws in the laws of power is make it look effortless. Don't let people know that you had to work so hard for it. Right. So I try not to show all of the excruciating, tedious <laughs> labor that went into it. But to recognize it, you know, it feels very nice. So thank you. I mean, how does anyone not write? I mean... It's, I know that is one of your laws that is to make it look effortless, but when a book is how many thousand, I mean, this, this book alone is what, 600 pages? And the new one, yeah. The, and the older ones. Like this no, one, that one's more like four something. Four, four something. 50. Maybe, okay, fine, 500. We're like splitting <laughs> hairs here. But it's also very, it's written in small print and the detail is unbelievable. What was your favorite, of all the books that you've written, what has been your favorite book to write? Well, I have to say The 48 Laws of Power because prior to that book, um, I was living in Los Angeles. I was working in Hollywood, and I wasn't very happy. I was kind of depressed, to be honest with you. I was about 36 years old. Things weren't quite working out for me, and uh, I was sort of, I knew I wanted to write, but I couldn't figure out what it was I was meant to write. And then I met a man, um, Yost Elfers, who's, you see the name on there, he was a book packager. And we were in Italy at the time, and he asked me if I had an idea for a book. And I suddenly improvised what turned into the 48 Laws of Power. And the reason it's my favorite book is it just totally turned my life around. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't be here talking to you, obviously, if it weren't for that book. It was also great timing because nowadays you'd never be able to pull off a book like that. Publishers wouldn't have gone near it. So it just changed it. It was kind of like, you know, it, at Disneyland they have Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. You know, it's like this insane ride that you go on. <laughs> right, right. This is kind of like after that book, it was like Mr. Toad's Wild Ride for me. I'm being invited to Italy to meet ex, the ex-president of Italy. I'm hobnobbing. You know, I meet rappers, all these things. This whole world opened up. So just for that reason alone, I'd say it was my favorite book. The it Art changed of, your life. It changed my yeah. life. The Art of Seduction was probably the most fun book to write, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I can imagine why, yeah. right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And then the and the new book, The Laws of Human Nature, I feel like all the books, though, help each other out. Like, there's a lot of, like, synergies between yeah. them. Like, if you read The Laws of Human Nature, understanding why people do what they do and, the, and, what, and human nature dovetails nicely into The 48 Laws of Power, really, right? Because right. that's how you influence people and gain power. I feel like there's a lot of... There's a lot of like interconnectedness. There is. You know, and your background, like you've had 80 jobs before you even started, right? Or something like that. Well, my wife and I once tried to count because she, she's heard, my, you had that job? And three <laughs> months later, oh, you had that job? And so one day she said, how many jobs did you actually have? And we sat down with a piece of paper. I think we got to 60. And then I, know, I said, I know there are others that I can't remember because there were periods in my life. Right. But, you know, in college, I had all like 10 different jobs. Then I lived in Europe and I did construction work in Greece. I taught English in Spain. I worked in a hotel in Paris. I worked for a TV company in London. In New York, I had all these different jobs in journalism. Uh, and here in L.A., I worked for a detective agency. I worked in Hollywood. It ran the gamut. Over. Yeah, but that's sort of what a writer is supposed to do, you know, because if I'm claiming, you know, I don't have a degree in psychology. But if I'm claiming to know something about what motivates human behavior, about power and human nature, at least those 80 jobs taught, was like going to graduate school. Right. I had a degree in human behavior because I saw so much shit. Can I use this? Yeah, words? you can say whatever I you want. I saw so much shit, so much manipulation, so much crap. 
that I, you know, I think I'm qualified to write these books now. Right. So you basically feel like just by pure observation, you were just able to be, I was going to say, what, what, what made you feel not just qualified, but did you ever know that you even had it in you to be so, so good? Well, the other element is I read a lot. So I'm reading a lot of history, mm. philosophy, and psychology. So those two things, kind of my experience in that, kind of creates the soil for me able to write the book. But, you know, before I wrote the book, I was living in a one-bedroom apartment in Santa Monica. And I'm the same person, you know. I would give advice to people, and they'd go, who are you? You know, what are you giving me advice? You live in this little <laughs> one-bedroom apartment in Santa Monica. Nothing changed. It's just now with the books, everybody listens to me. Right. But my wife, who knew me back then, she said, you know, I do remember you would always give me advice. And it was the most, ama I never heard advice like that. It was the most amazing stuff. It really helped me. So there was something sort of brewing right. back then in those early 90s. It just took the book to, for me to synthesize all these various parts of my brain. Well, you know, it's funny. That's a good segue into what I was going to talk to you about, right? Because um, in your latest Laws of Human Nature, you know, do you think that there are people who are just maybe, uh, you said you were always really good at giving advice, that there are people that are more innately just more tuned in and keyed into to that type of thing? Like, I mean, there are people who are good to talk to because they're much more self-aware and they're much more um, empathetic. And so there is there is that element. Like, you naturally obviously were that one of those people that it kind of you came by it honestly, so to speak, right? Well, it's a good question of is it nature or nurture? So is it something that is your brain wired that way? There's probably an element to it. So, for instance, it's a known fact through studies, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah. that um, <clears throat> women are more naturally empathetic than men. Is there something about the way their brain, the way women's brains are wired, or is it from the fact that women are socialized to be more attentive to the needs of other people? How do you answer that question? Um, I think probably from my upbringing, from the relationship to my parents, where I wasn't neglected, but I was sort of left alone. And so my way of surviving in this world was to observe people. You know, that was the only way I could feel secure was to understand what, so that I wouldn't get hurt. That I wouldn't, my parents weren't abusive at all. They were very mm -hmm. kind. But, you know, I wasn't getting the attention that I thought I needed. So I had to be, turn myself into a very keen observer. And my sister is like that as well. So there's something in, I think, the way we were raised mm -hmm. that turned us this way. But, you know, I wouldn't write these books if I don't believe it's something you can learn. You know, so because I'm interested in other people, probably for means of protection and defense, so it maybe started from something maybe slightly negative, um, I spent many years observing, right? And when you observe and you spend years doing it, it becomes a skill. It's like I can sense people's energy really quickly now. You know, I have a feel for, for who they are. I, I can tell from their body, like the things you can't even verbalize because I've been doing it for so long. So my point in the book is, you know, you may be 30 years old or 40, you know, it's never too late to start because a human being has these innate, incredible innate powers. Mm -hmm. They call it theory of mind, the ability that we can put ourselves in the shoes of another person and imagine what they're thinking. And they've demonstrated that infants at the age of six months old demonstrate that they have this theory of mind. No other animal comes close to that, although they say maybe dolphins at some point. But So you have that, you the listener out there, you have that potential. You have the, those built-in tools to use. It's just a matter of using them. So getting out in more social situations, getting away from your stupid phone and going out in public and dealing with people and looking at them and observing them and going through exercises that I have in the book, slowly you'll get better at it. And it's actually a lot of fun. You know, you spend $20 to go to a movie to get inside the world of somebody else and it's so exciting. Oh, the psycho, the psycho killer, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Other people in your daily life have their stories, have their myths, have their own fantasies. It's just as exciting to try and get into their world as it is to get inside Silence of the Lambs or whatever movie you want to watch. So you, everybody, it's something you can learn. It's not just you're either born that way or you're doomed to, to not having this power. Right. I mean, 
I guess what I was saying that you already had a natural inclination and interest, right? So it starts with a kernel of interest and curiosity and maybe and maybe you were, you were naturally better at it than some. But I think what you're saying, and I tend to agree, is that anything you put attention to, you can get better at. Right. But it's being putting attention towards it right. and, you, and practicing it over and right. over again. Um, and you were saying kind of like, I mean, your, your whole book about, it, it, well, not the whole book, but a lot of what your book talks about, um, there are a few, there's a few different things, but is mat, like being self-aware, right? Understanding where, where you came from, because where you came from, it's going to be a good, it's a good point to know why you are the way you are and having that type of self-awareness. How does someone who doesn't have that natural inclination gain self-awareness? Well, you have to read the book. <laughs> it will help. The book I hope all, so. That's the main point of the whole book. Right. So um, you, you need to become a superior observer of other people, but it begins by being able to observe yourself. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a process. There's no, like, quick answer to that. So the first thing is I try to show you certain things that you need to be aware of that I think... One of the points in my book, particularly in mastery, is people don't become good at something unless they like it. And it's very much mm. demonstrated in neuroscience. When the brain is engaged and excited, suddenly we learn at a much faster rate, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in learning French, you'll learn it really quickly as opposed to someone who's forced to learn it. It could take Absolutely. years. So if you want to, if you're motivated to observe people, to look at yourself, then you will start to do it. And so how do you get motivated? Well, I try to make the point in the book that the number one thing to understand is you are a stranger to yourself. You do not know who you are. You do not know why you act the way you do. You have no idea what motivates your behavior, why you choose this partner to be with, why you're interested in this product, why you choose this person to be a, a, a politician that you vote for. You don't know because 95% of what we do comes from unconscious processes. Mm. So if you think about that, wow. it's kind That's of good. slightly frightening. So, you know, why did I, you know, and this is a very banal example, why did I buy an Audi when I could have bought 20 different other cars? Well, if I think about it, you know, it probably has to do with the fact of, I, I don't see myself as somebody who buys a Mercedes, but probably I've looked at ads that have influenced me. I've seen other people. It wasn't like, me consciously deciding this is the car I want. It was influenced by all these mm -hmm. unconscious factors. And people who do marketing, they know this very well, that what makes you choose to buy a product is emotional reasons that you're not even aware of. They know all of these unconscious tricks to make you interested in their product. So you walk around, you're like a sleepwalker. You don't know why you make the decisions you make. And a very good re um, example is the people you choose for intimate partners in your life. You, have really, you can't really explain or verbalize why you're attracted to a person. And oftentimes, if you pay close attention, you notice that there'll be certain patterns in people you choose. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these patterns aren't very healthy. Uh, not necessarily always, right. but sometimes. Why? Why am I attracted to this person who's sort of a narcissist and isn't going to be a great person to have a relationship? And then the second person I choose is exactly the same, even though I was hurt by the first person. What's going on? I'm challenging you to look at yourself and say, look in the mirror and say, I don't really know who I am. I don't know why I make choices, why I follow this career path, etc. So if you're like in a dark room, it's kind of scary. You're groping, you're tripping over things. Well, you're operating in a dark room. Mm -hmm. You don't know why you're doing things. You're groping around and you're making mistakes. So you have to be motivated to try and look at yourself and understand who you are by virtue of the fact that your ignorance of who you are is causing negative patterns in your life. We all want to improve ourselves. That's why we go to self-help books. That's why you read my book. But you're never going to improve yourself unless you understand who you are, unless you look squarely in the eye and admit your flaws, mm -hmm. admit the bad patterns in your life. So it's almost like, you know, a, a Alcoholics Anonymous. You have to right. get down on your knees and admit, I don't know who I am. And because that's a frightening thought, I have, I'm now motivated to try and make the steps to understand. Right. And that's why I think the first step is like you said, like ask yourself the question, like take a pause 
and say, why am I doing what I'm doing? What is the reason behind this? Like right. that initial, I think that, that even that initial moment of, or that second of pause makes you maybe retrain your brain to think Definitely. a little bit, right? Like Definitely. A, and then you just mentioned something about, uh, which is what I want to talk to you about is the dark side, right? Everyone has these hidden things about them. But you said that when someone has a dark side, they, they should kind of, um, embrace their, their embrace their dark side mm -hmm. um, because it can be liberating what do you mean by that exactly well um, I explain in the book is a chapter on what, on what the great psychologist Carl Jung called mm -hmm. the shadow so you see the right. moon you see the front of the moon and then there's the back side that you never see well every person has a dark side of the moon has a dark side as a shadow side where does it come from it comes from your early childhood when you were a child, when you were two or three years old, you were this complete ball of energy. You were like a round ball. You experienced all of these emotions. You could be angry. You could even be very resentful, even hate your parents. The next moment you love them. You could be very aggressive. You could be very peaceful. Right. Children have this, they're a complete being. They're not, they haven't learned how to control themselves, right? That's who they are. And then as they get older, they feel pressure. Parents are telling them, come on, you have to behave. You're, you're wearing me out. People, you know, you, you have to look good for other people. So you feel pressure to kind of alter your behavior to fit in better. Mm -hmm. Teachers do that. Peers do that. You get older and older and older. And those complete qualities that you had, some of which could be seen as negative, were like repressed, right. were pushed down, right? But they don't disappear. Nothing that you repress ever disappears. It's there. It's lying inside of you. It's latent. It's an energy that's there all of the time. And what happens is you get older, you feel like you're cut off from part of who you are. You feel like a part of yourself got sawed off and is floating behind you, and it's painful. And that part of you will come out eventually because it's, there's a lot of tension there from the shadow. It wants to be expressed. So when you're angry, when you're stressful, when things aren't going your way, when you're frustrated, suddenly you'll explode and you'll do things that, that normally you would never do. You know, the 65-year-old the professor will leave his wife and run off with a 20-year-old <laughs> student. Kind Welcome of thing. to L.A., actually. Exactly. That's a lot here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah. um, you know, th but that side of you, you know, you're, I'm trying to tell you, you're a complete person. It's no good to deny or repress these parts of you. It's better to embrace and accept it and not be a hypocrite. So you're not saying really to act on it. It's just a question of just accepting, um, acknowledging that it's there. Yes, but more than that, it's using that energy. Somewhere, but you use it towards something more productive. Yeah, productive. Pro-social, productive. So for me, I say if I have to do my own self-analysis, mm -hmm. I'm a really competitive person. I hate losing. I hate losing in anything. Right. And it's kind of gross. It can be kind of an ugly trait sometimes. Where do I channel it? I've learned to channel it into my work. I want to make, I want to sell more books right. than my friend. I want to make a great book. I want to have a lot of success. So I pour it into my work. And there's nothing wrong with that because I'm actually creating some value for society. Right. If you feel very angry about the way the world is, pour your energy into working for a just cause, for justice in this world. And don't just sit there and spew and get resentful and get on the internet and spew hatred. Actually do something. Pour that energy into something productive. If you're an artist, you're a filmmaker or a writer, take that anger, angry energy that we all have and put it into your work. I have a lot of also, I do have a lot of anger. I think from my years in Hollywood, I kind of resent people who are hypocrites. I don't like hypocrites. Right. And I poured all that into my books. I, I express it in my books. There's a layer of anger in the 48 Laws of Power. But I don't, it's not explosive, it's controlled, it's channeled. Channel that energy, channel that dark energy into something productive because it's very, very powerful. And the other thing I would say is we admire like rock stars, like a, a David Bowie or a Madonna. And we admire them because they're more authentic. They're displaying their shadow yeah, and they're I not afraid of it. And we go, wow. That's like a real human being. We're secretly attracted to people like that who aren't so controlled and repressed, whereas we're kind of repulsed by people who've like tamped down their shadow. And I talk in the book about Richard Nixon 
as somebody who was very uncomfortable with himself. Right. And it made other people kind of uncomfortable. You know, you say something, I'm curious what you think about this, right? Because there's a couple of different points between the 48 Laws of Power and this book. You're saying people who express themselves, right? But one of your things was, and in in, I think it was 48 Laws of Power, was to be kind of like, extra, like to kind of be flamboyant in a way, to, sh to stand out, right? That's one of your points. So at what point is someone being authentic and that's who they are versus putting on a show or an act because they know they're, they're being somewhat manipulative because they know, like a Madonna, for example, or that if they don't stand out, they'll just kind of like fade into the back background. Well, the quality of being a kind of a show off is something that you either have or don't have. It's hard to put it on, it's hard to fake it. You know, what you can do is you can learn, you sense when you're a child, when you're eight years old, that when I'm dramatic, when I make a, a show of something, when I have a tantrum, people pay attention to me. Right. And then you learn, if you're a manipulative type or you're power hungry, you learn how to use that energy. Maybe you become an actor, maybe you become a politician or right. whatever. Okay, and you channel it into that, and you learn to exaggerate it. You learn to use it for effect. But I don't think you can turn an, etro an introvert into someone who likes to show off and be an exhibitionist. I think it's very difficult because you have to kind of have pleasure and enjoy that element of, of getting that kind of attention, and not everybody has that. You know, so the art of seduction is all about that. The art of seduction, I talk about the nine types of seducers. Right. And one of them is the type that we're talking about here. Right. Um, and what I'm trying to say is, you out there, the listener, you fit one of these nine archetypes. It's sort of who you are. You were wired that way. And the game is to be aware of who you are. Oh, I'm a siren. I'm a rake. I'm, I'm a charmer. And then to exaggerate, to bring it out more. And, you know, I talk a lot. My view of humans is we are all actors. None, none of us go around in our social lives just being who we are. We don't tell people, oh, you don't look so good today. You know, <laughs> oh, your screenplay sucks. We are the opposite, right? We right. learn early on to act. Right. Some people are better actors than others. But you need, you need to be good, an actor in life. And I don't think there should be anything negative attached to it. It's just your question is, how do we know whether it's authentic or not? I think you can feel it to a degree. So, you know, when you see a performer and they're, they're giving everything, there's a sense of, you know, it feels real. You feel, yeah, you do. You sometimes feel there are people that are rock stars or musicians or actors where it does feel like they're, they're kind of having to fake it. I mean, we can sense the difference. When, someone's contri when something's contrived, you feel. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, you know, now going, circling right back again to uh, human nature, you're talking a lot about how we're all some level we're all have we're all narcissistic to some capacity yes. right but i found it interesting you were saying that um the deep narcissists tend to end up being quite successful in life they can be right they'd be like a ceo of a technology company because so is it because tell me well why don't you talk about that a little bit i'm interested in that why why do you think they can be because well Okay, so to, to do that, I have to explain where, why we are all narcissists. I'll be trying to make it as brief as possible. You don't have to be brief at all. Okay. I love having you here. I don't want you to ever go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> be as, um, as long-winded as possible. Okay, don't tell me that. You're, you're going to regret saying that. <laughs> I will not. Trust okay. me. Um, well, I'm trying to say to the reader of this book, get off your high horse. Stop saying, oh, it's the other person who's aggressive. It's the other person who's got envy, not me. I love that when you said that. Yeah. It's always that person who is that person. Yeah. No, you are <laughs> implicated. We're all cut from the same yeah. cloth. We all have the same flaws. We all have the same tendencies. We all have selfish, narcissistic tendencies. We are all to some degree self-absorbed. So get over this. The person who says, oh, no, I'm not a narcissist is the biggest fucking narcissist <laughs> of them all because they're singing, singling themselves out as if they're superior. Right. This is a sure sign of narcissism. Where does it come from? It comes from the fact that when we were children, we had a lot of attention, most of us, not all of us, had a lot of mm -hmm. attention from our parents. And then a point is reached when we're four years old, maybe a little earlier, where they start withdrawing that attention because they realize we have to be independent, because they have other siblings to attend to, because they have other things. So you're not getting that intense attention that you got from the mother or even the father early on. And for, it's a very painful moment. You have to start to learn to be independent. 
And the process that we go through is we develop a self, an image of ourselves. It's almost like you're looking at yourself and it's projected on a wall. And that self has good qualities. You love that self. It has, you know, it has things that you're comfortable with. It has certain tastes and desires that you, who you are, and you like that. And so in those moments when you feel pain, when you feel abandoned, when you don't feel you get your attention, you are able to withdraw into yourself and not feel so bad. You're able to get the love from yourself. You don't depend it on other people. You're not aware of that process because it all happened unconsciously. But psychologists have demonstrated, have cataloged it. It's, very, it's a very real phenomenon. And so slowly, unconsciously, you develop this idea of yourself, this kind of ideal version of who you are. And as you get older, this tendency gets stronger and stronger. You like other people who share your own values. You like other people who flatter you. You like people who like you. These are all signs of your self-absorption of your narcissism. There's nothing negative about it. Stop judging yourself. Every single person you know has these tendencies. Even St. Teresa had these tendencies, all right? It's so true, though, when you think about it, right? Like, we tend to like the people who like us the most, right? Yeah. Right. That's just what we do, right? Like right. if someone flatters, they'll say, oh, you're so great. You're so nice. You're so this, you're so that. Because it makes you feel good, you want to be around that person, obviously. Right. And, and look on social media. Who do, you, who do you glom on to? You glom on to the people who have the same values, the same ideas as you do. Because they're like mirrors to yourself. Mirrors to yourself. You know, you're looking at yourself when you look at them and their nice feelings and their good ideas are your good ideas as well. So you're a narcissist. Just admit it. Now... The but deep narcissists. Some people are what I call deep narcissists. And they had a childhood that was different. They come usually from some, maybe a broken home. There are two things where things can become dysfunctional. A, the parent neglects them or is abusive. And the, and the love and affection that they expect is actually the opposite. All right, so they're not able to develop that self that is able to love because they feel they actually hate themselves. The inner self, you were saying, yeah. Or, or B... The parent overwhelms them with attention and suffocates them to the point where they're not able to develop an independent self. Either way, that, that self-image that we come to love isn't, is, is aborted. It doesn't, it doesn't grow. It's not organic. And so when the child reaches five or six years old, in those moments of pain, when they're not getting the love they need, instead of turning inward, they have to do, turn outward. They have to become a performer. They have to act out to get attention. They have to throw a tantrum. They have to be extremely dramatic. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that drama is very exciting. We've seen children like that who are always performing. They're very cute. They're very charming. They know how to get attention through their wit, through their antics, right? Okay. But it, comes, it, it can come from an inner emptiness. They're acting out. They have to. It's the only way they can get the love and attention they need. So... I compare it to a thermostat that you have in your, in your, in your brain. So let's say there's a 50% mark right in the middle. That's where half of your attention is to yourself and the other half is towards other people. And the higher you go up on that towards 100 is the more you're capable of putting yourself into the thoughts and minds of other people, getting outside of yourself. The lower down you go, the more self-absorbed you become. So we naturally... I call us functional narcissists. We're able to function in this world. We're narcissists, but we can function well. And we're normally at that halfway point. Sometimes we rise above because we're very interested in people. Maybe we fall in love or maybe because of work, we really have to focus on people. We can rise to 60 to 70. But then when we're depressed, we kind of go down and we get more self-absorbed. We go down to 30 and 40. But that thermostat will raise us up so that we never get too self-absorbed because we'll pay a price for that. Deep narcissists can never get above that mark. They're always down below. They don't have that thermostat. They're always locked inside of themselves. And as they get older, they have to become more and more dramatic to get that attention. Mm -hmm. Now, that could become a very positive trait, or it seemed to be, because it, it can be charismatic, right? So you learned as a child when you were five or six years old to be very dramatic to get attention. Now, imagine you've been doing that for 20 for 15, 17 years, and you're in your 20s, you're like a master at getting attention, right? Mm -hmm. And you have this kind of energy where I need love from you people. I need love from you. 
and it's very seductive and people will give you that loving energy. You're a, you're a master at magnet at attracting that energy, right? But it comes from an inner emptiness and at some point it can turn against you. But you look at people, I worked, I was on the board of directors for a company called American Apparel. Oh, I love American Apparel. Yeah. Yes. Um, the, the founder of it was an admirer of my books, etc. Shocking. Yeah. <laughs> but he, I, you know, I love him. He was a great person, but he was an incredible deep narcissist, right? Right. Um, I take your word for it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, trust. <laughs> <laughs> trust you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, <clears throat> but because of that, he had incredible charisma and everybody was attracted to him for it. But then there was a very dark side to it, which ended up being his undoing. We can see our current president as somebody oh. who is definitely a deep narcissist. I would say Elon Musk, and it's been demonstrated to be profiles. My friend Neil Strauss did a profile of him. He definitely has very strong narcissistic tendencies, and he's very dramatic and very charismatic. It's a source of his power, but it's also a great weakness. A lot of great artists are, are, are deep narcissists, right. um, but they're able to put it into their work and create great things. So, you know, that's their way of, of, of dealing with it. See, it's funny. You say the word cares. A lot of times what I notice when that behavior, like Donald Trump or whoever, to me, that's not, I don't see charisma. I just see like, it's annoying. And it's well, like, yeah, I, I didn't, I wouldn't it's say uncomfortable because I, you, when you, you feel that they're like, they're just unraveling or they're trying too hard. Like, I think that it, that quality of trying too hard is, is like the opposite of charismatic in yes, a way. But, well, yeah, I, I, I'm not saying everybody who's a deep narcissist no, but, is charismatic. But no, but you're, I know what you're saying, but I'm saying it like it builds up that kind of um, personality where people are magnets towards it. Yeah. Right. I mean, a classic example that I use in the art of seduction is Marilyn Monroe. She was right. an orphan. She came from a terrible background. She was completely ne neglected as a child. A lot of great actresses have that same background. Right. A lot of act, I think a lot of Hollywood is like that. Yeah, definitely. You know, and then when you, when you peel the, the layers of the onions, that's when you really find the, the wounds. The underneath. wounds, exactly. Yeah. That's what, I mean, so that's why I, I tend to, I know what you're talking about, especially where we live, right? Yeah, we're in the heart you, of it. We're in the heart of it. You see like what people show you on the outside, it's very different than what really happens on the inside. Right. Right. And so, and, and that's another thing you were talking, what you said, which I, I really kind of, uh, keyed into was pick people with for their character not because they're charismatic or because of intelligence because right. character is the most important thing right and I think a lot of times we that's how we get ourselves in trouble right because we, we pick people because we're drawn to that bright shiny light right right so you know your your fate in life is to, we're a social animal your fate is tied with the people you choose to associate mm -hmm. with there's no getting around that and you're either associating with people of good quality, of good character, or people of negative qualities and negative character. And the difference between how you make those choices will be the difference between being happy or unhappy, being successful or failing in life. So I know I've done consulting work with a lot of very powerful people in business, in sports and entertainment, and their choices of the wrong business partner is why they come to me 90, not 90, but over half the time, right? Right. I thought this this man was he was so you know he's so smart, had a great resume, great ideas, and then the next thing I know, he's he's like stolen the company from me, or the next thing I know, he was actually really stupid and he made really bad decisions, and they they have suffered. Their company is destroyed. They lost a lot of money. Their reputations are ruined. It can cause real trauma. Right. These kind of bad toxic relationships, bad choices. So what is the root of the problem? The root of the problem is human nature. We're animals. We judge things based on appearances. Mm -hmm. It takes effort to stand back and say, maybe the appearance, maybe the smile, maybe the mask that people are wearing isn't reality. We, we're not primed for that. Naturally, we see someone laughing. We see someone liking our jokes. We see someone saying the right things, and we, we respond to it. Right. We don't have that cynical or that mistrust gene that says maybe it's not all what it seems so if somebody we're hiring somebody in there they've got a witty charming personality and a good resume we hire them but they have bad character now what do i mean by bad character 
Character is something that you can measure as strength or weakness. It's not a, it's not a moral judgment. It's a strong character or a weak character. So there's the kind of metal that, that they call it's a tensile quality. That metal can bend, but it doesn't break, right? And that's how they de design jets for that, to have that right. kind of metal, right? And that's a kind of strength. It's a really strong metal that can bend a little bit. It never breaks. That's the kind of quality you want inside of a person. You want to judge their inner strength. And what do I mean by that? Okay, well, here's a few good barometers. How do people handle stress? Under stress, that metal shows its weaknesses. So somebody, you hire somebody and they seem brilliant and everything. Then the shit hits the fan, there's pressure. And suddenly they can become hysterical. They make bad choices. They can become extremely selfish. You go, I never saw that side of them. It's because they were hiding it and only stress reveals it. Right. Stress reveals character. Just as power, a position of power reveals character. When somebody is rising to the top, they'll be all charming and wonderful. Then they get power and suddenly they turn into a raging asshole. Yeah. Because the power has gone to their head. You didn't see that until they've gotten to the position of power. That's their character being revealed. But you can see signs of it early on in how they treat other people, how they treat the people below them. Okay, So pay attention to the little things that people reveal, like how organized is their desk? How organized are they always late? Do they get things in on time? Do they treat other people who they don't have to treat well? Do they treat them well? Everybody in the company. You know, I talked in one of my books about Louis XIV. He would treat everybody in the Palace of Versailles with incredible kindness, even the cooks, even the maids, etc. You want people like that who are able to treat people who they don't have to be good to, but they're nice to. That reveals something about them. Okay, How do they handle criticism? Yeah. Can they take criticism? Or do they wither up and become whiny, weepy little kids, you know, or get all defensive? That shows you that inner strength, that tensile quality. I had a, a Ryan Holiday, you probably heard of Ryan. Yes, that was, and a book of his is over there. The new one? Yeah. Stillness? Yeah, Stillness. Yeah, it's good. It's yeah. a great book. I haven't read it yet. I've been too busy with your 70,000 oh. books. And oh, sorry. <laughs> no, well, I love you'll it. Get to it. No, this is, I'm more than happy to be busy with your stuff. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, Ryan was my assistant years ago on one of my, on my books. Uh, you know, I've kind of helped him get the career that he has now. But the thing that made Ryan stand out was I could criticize him about his work in a very kind of you know, pragmatic way. He never took it personally. I was yeah. shocked because my idea sometimes is younger people, they tend to get very sensitive. I know I was when I was young. No, he was a perfect gentleman. He understood it and he used that information to get better. Right. That's a sign Constructive of, criticism. He yeah. took it. Yes. A lot of people are very, that's, how, that's a great way of seeing someone's true character, right? They're yeah. not like flimsy and like just, just basically break down because you're, you're criticizing them. Right. So that shows inner strength. Right. You want to find people like that to hire, to even be your intimate partner, because it will, you know, you'll avoid all that unnecessary, mm -hmm. ugly drama. You'll get along better. You'll have, you know, an easier life. Everything will go smoother if you make the right choices. So when you meet someone and you're in that position where you have to make a choice, think first of their character. How can I gauge it? And don't get you know seduced by their appearances. Right. No, I think that's a great that's a great point, and I think it's very true. Um, and I think a lot of times, though, people, you know, it's hard. It's hard in the moment, right? Because you get so like, uh, you, get, you get so like engulfed into like how they're how they're charming and nice and and and, and flattering. And yeah. but I think the character is a huge one. And. Um, yeah, I think it's a great one. The other thing we were talking about is self-opinion, right? Because um, in your book, it's if if you have to basically, I, f I feel it. I don't know if it's manipulative. It is, but I feel like that's what it is. When you have to cater to how someone feels about themselves, I really like this part. Like, it's like for example, if you have a certain opinion of yourself, the way I would influence that or uh, penetrate that is if I cater to that. Just how it would be like if you were with somebody who has a really low opinion of themselves. If you're too nice to them, they won't like you, right? right because right. they're used to being treated badly. Right. Which I think, again, like 
why, why I think you're so, why I really love your writing is because I think you really tap into a really what the nonverbal cues that people really tell a lot more with, right? It's right. not just what, because they say this and because they act like that. It's all the like behind, like the nuance in someone's behavior that you really kind of get, get someone's true character and how people really like think and how you really influence them. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's very well put. I mean, think of it this way. With words, I could lie. I could say anything. Right. I could say I am the greatest basketball player who ever lived. <laughs> you should see me. I scored 70 points. I played Michael Jordan one-on-one and I beat him. I could lie. Of you know, words are, are easy to lie. But nonverbal behavior, patterns of behavior, actions, they don't lie. You can't lie with them. Mm -mm. The actions that you've done in the past, your patterns of behavior reveal who you are. Your, your fake smile, your negative body posture reveals how you really are feeling, not your words. Right. So pay attention to this other language. I call it a second language. The language of actions, of patterns of behavior, and of nonverbal communication. Because they're eloquent. They, they actually tell you the truth. Right. And then how do you, so if someone has a bad, bad opinion of themselves, right? Because like we were talking earlier, people's natural inclination is to be flattering and kind and tell them all these things. What happens if, when you do that, like there's been times when like, you know, I know when men do this all the time, right? They try to like get, get with a girl or whatever. And that girl has such baggage and whatever. And like, they're like, I don't understand why she doesn't like me. Like I sent her flowers. I called her on time. I right. did this. I did that. And like nothing. And she's dating some like jerk off. Because like that girl's used to being treated that way. Right, she doesn't right. know any different. Right. But how do you figure that out early on to kind of, I hate to say it, but to influence and help, you know, to kind of get what you want? Well, there are clearly signs of it. I mean, if you, if you paid attention to that woman, she would show signs of in, great insecurities. I mean, you know, you can't really hide that. You, would, you know, and by the f fact that you're sending her flowers and she's not responding is already a sign <laughs> exactly. that something is, is exactly. going on. Exactly. But it's all a matter of paying attention to people because they do reveal it. So most people have a positive self-opinion, but I'd say 10% or 20%, maybe more. We all have a negative opinion. I was going to say, you think it's that low? Well, I, I think that we all have a negative opinion of ourselves to some extent. Right. But most of it is relatively positive. And some, even people with a negative opinion, they manage to turn it into a virtue. They manage to say, everyone has screwed me. I've been a victim. Everybody hates me. And it's their way of feeling kind of justified and superior to others. I'm a better victim. I've, I've suffered more than other people. Therefore, you know, that makes me kind of something higher than Right, others. superior so, in a way. Because you don't want to go, nobody likes going around in life just totally hating yourself. So you turn even your the qualities you don't like into something almost negative, almost positive. But let's just say more people than not do have a high self-opinion. And studies, psychology, psychological studies have demonstrated this. So when it comes to our intelligence, we tend to rate it higher than it actually is. We think our IQ is higher than it actually is. When it comes to our uh, autonomous, our autonomy that we make decisions on our own, we tend to have a higher opinion. We think we're more rational than we actually are. When it, <clears throat> when it comes to, what was the other aspect? Excuse me, I just... Emotion, you said no, no, rational, no. Um, Oh, yeah, oh, goodness, morality. Oh, morality. We kind of have an image of ourselves that's better than the actual mm -hmm. truth. We think we're a little more saintly than we actually are. Those are fairly universal traits in people. Some people not, I agree. Some people have that lower element. But you'll find most people will rate themselves higher in those areas. And then there'll be individual qualities where people will think, I'm a rebel. I don't stand up. I, I hate all authority. And that's their self-opinion, right? They think of mm -hmm. themselves that way. You have to gauge people's self-opinion. And if you cross it, if somehow you make people feel that they're not so smart, if you make people feel that they're really not acting on their own willpower, that other people are influencing mm -hmm. them. If you make them feel that they're not really that good, if you make them feel that they're not as much of a rebel as they think they are, you've created an enemy, a secret enemy. They may smile and say, oh, huh, yeah, but now you've, got, you've turned somebody into a potential enemy. They don't, you know, a point has been crossed 
and you're never going to probably will never repair that because that self opinion is tied into their happiness mm -hmm. to their feeling of who they are challenging that is deeply deeply stirring up insecurities from deep within you do not ever want to do that right mm -hmm. no okay? absolutely not so you can call that manipulative but you can also look at it another way we go through life what is the what is the biggest human need besides food and shelter and um, you know basic love from protection from our parents what would you say the biggest need is uh, besides love influence I don't know um, our biggest need food shelter happiness uh, connection I would say okay. wouldn't that be well I, I is it, it a wrong it, it answer be, here no it's not a wrong answer they're all good <laughs> answers but I would say it's the desire to be validated to have recognition Oh, rec that, well, that, well that, of course, that's your whole book right yeah, there. <laughs> exactly. Right. Recognition. So think of how little in life you get that recognition. You're out with meeting someone when you're with friends. Everyone's in their own phone. Everyone's in their own world. No one's actually paying attention to who you are. If you actually meet somebody who actually listens to what you said and actually validates your opinion, actually makes you feel that you're really a good person, it's pretty rare in life. You don't get that feeling very often, that kind of quality, individualized attention. People are hungry for it. And you don't have to fake it. Everybody has good qualities. Everybody has decent qualities. Uh, you know, it's interesting you're saying this right now about recognition, um, not just because it's in your book, but I did a whole podcast before you about what the key thing to employee morale in a company is, and it's employees having, being, it's all about recognition. Yeah. The whole, a whole idea of corporate culture is based on someone feeling that they, that, that, that they matter and that they're right. recognized for right. their work. or right. their, Yeah, it's true. Right. It's, a, it's a deep need. It's, it's also a, a need, need to feel that you are an individual. You're not just a cog in a machine. Right. You're not just you know, a piece that people are using. You actually matter. Your ideas matter, etc. We're hungry for that kind of mm -hmm. attention. So if you're able to supply that, you're giving something... So, something very rare to people and it's very positive and you will then have room now you can call it manipulation I tend to say you'll have in, you can have influence. influence over them and we all want influence if you can't influence your children if you can't get them to stop their negative irritating behavior right you feel terrible Believe you drive me, you know. crazy <laughs> your kids I've got two kids oh, yeah okay. I totally agree because I you know I was reading a couple different things about you uh, but your books and stuff, and people are like uh, being it's so man it's, this can be manipulative. I'm like, it's actually not manipulative. It's actually what it's like the truth. It's yeah. being real because yeah. everyone needs at some level to have influence. Forget about if if you want to be if you want to climb a corporate ladder. If you have children, you have to have influence over them. If you have a a, a spouse or a partner, you want to have influence. Exactly, influence is not a bad thing. Right, to have influence, it's not yeah. it's not like a bad word, and no. people take it as such. Yeah, and I. So I agree with you. I think yeah. that's obviously, it's, impor it's, it's important to have that at any level. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, and extend it to work. If you can't get people interested in your ideas, right. how are you ever going to write that book or make that movie or create that, that, uh, you know, that business that you want to found? You have to be able to get people excited or interested in you. And a lot of that depends on your knowledge of human nature, yeah. what motivates people. So if you present an idea to a potential investor and it's all about you and your great idea and you pay no attention to them, you're actually turning them off. You're actually saying to the person you're addressing, well, what is my interest in that? Why should I fund that? You know, I don't, it's all about you really. And instead you want to make it about them and their self-interest and what they're going to get out of it and how wonderful they are and how great this is going to be for them. You turn things around and suddenly the game changes. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. And you know, you it's, it, and what you're going to what I was going to say to that is like when you want it, when you want anything from somebody, you don't give them your you don't say to them, you need to help me because I I I I I. Right. right. You got to find what makes them what, what 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 kind of is that thing about what they need and what they want right. because people tap into that much quicker. Right? Right? Um and I wanted to I wanted to talk to you about a part of your book about envy because again I, I a lot of these things like I think are so so true and like it's emotion it's it's, it's actually it's, it is human nature people are envious even at any level at, at so many different levels and you like break them down into like these four so 
of if we all have envy, right? Because that's kind of what we talk, what you what you talk about. Um, a number one, like how we can get away from that and switch it around to be more positive. So, like, how did you come up with like for for the, this four: the leveler, the self entitled slacker, the status fiend, and the atta- and the attack attacher? Right? Those are the four common. I think there are more, but... Those are the four common ones. Okay. The four common ones. Which one is the most dangerous? Do you have a... Well, they all can be pretty dangerous. They are. Um, The attacher can be often the most dangerous. There are examples of people who've actually literally murdered the people that they attach to. Okay. And I talked about that. (laughs) But But we're naturally envious. That's a natural instinct, right? To be be envious of people around us in our peer group. Well, the, the human brain functions by comparing and contrasting. So when we receive sensory information, something new in our eyes see something, the brain instantly compares it to things that we've seen in the past. And we're a social animal. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to relationships with people, our brain, which is so focused on comparing, is actually continually comparing ourselves to other people. So we do the same thing in our social life. What do they have that I don't have? How is their career better than my career? How are their children better or worse than mine? You know, on and on and on. We're continually, if you stopped and were honest with yourself, which you're not usually, and looked at yourself, how often you're comparing yourself to what other people are doing, you'd be shocked at how often that thought is crossing your mind. Oh, absolutely. That's why I wanted to bring it up is because, especially in today's time with social media, it's, I think it's like rampant now, right? Because I think that the, 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 all the anxiety and depression levels are so skyrocketing. Like they're so high because you see glimmers of people's life on right. Instagram and fa- whatever it is, Facebook, whatever it is, TikTok now, and whatever the uh, the platform how, is. How old are your kids? Four and six. Oh, they're still they're still young. young. But my se- my six year old actually knows what TikTok is, oh, which is sad to me, yeah. right? Because I think it's just it's perpetuating this this problem. Yeah. You know, 15, 20 years ago. You know, not to age myself, but we didn't have this, so yeah. it was at it was it was more dull in our in our in our circa uh, surroundings, right? Now, anytime you like touch your phone, you have that like ping of envy, right? Because you right. see someone in a nicer trip, more money than you, mm-hmm. more you know what or. And I think what you said, why this was another thing that I thought was so so true is you're also a lot of times envious of people in your direct space right because yeah. like why are they more successful than me right. we've all been there and that's why when yeah. people are like ah it doesn't sound nice but it's the truth that's we all do it and why yeah. can we not talk about it right it would be much better to be honest about it right like it's true and so what i liked about when you said if you feel this way why not like you can reverse engineer it a little bit right like when you when you when you get stuck in that moment think of people who are less like who have less than you right right what were the other th- things that you were mentioning on that? Well, um, and so that in that case, yeah. you know, normally you're comparing yourself to people who have more. Right. Why not compare yourself to people who have less? So, you know, I had a stroke and it was pretty awful experience. It still is pretty awful. But, you know, and I look at the people who are running and swimming. <laughs> God damn it. What am I missing? But then I go to the hospital and for therapy and I see people who are a lot worse than me. Yeah. And boy, does that make me feel appreciative that I'm alive, that my brain is still functioning. So you can compare yourself. There are millions, billions of people on the planet who have less than you. Why not compare themselves to you and feel grateful for what you have instead of feeling envious of what other people uh, have that you don't have? The other thing is, um, so instead of feeling like you want to hurt somebody who has more than you, which is sort of the impulse that envy has, most of us don't act on that impulse to hurt. Some people do, and you have right. to be aware of them. They're very dangerous. But instead of comparing yourself to others and feeling a little bit angry at them, why not use the fact that people are doing better than you as a spur to motivate you to get rise to their level? Emulate them. Mm-hmm. Try and compete. Try and make, instead of trying to act like you're on their level with, your, with things that you post on the internet, why don't you actually learn some skill and actually found a business or write a book or create something that will make them envious of you. Right. Turn it into a positive competitive instinct. 
right? Right. Because ambition and competitiveness is not necessarily a negative thing if you channel it the right way. The other thing is you tend to feel, they call it schadenfreude. Yes, I know. I love that. I always, it's, schadenfreude is amazing. Well, schadenfreude means that you actually feel a little bit excited when other people have bad things happen to them. Kind of makes you feel good. It's a secret, you know, you never admit it. Right. You're a little happy when something, ha when something bad happens to somebody that's yeah. doing really well or yeah. that you're envious of. Right. But so I talk in the book about the opposite feeling, which would be actually feeling joy when somebody else has success. Now, I know that might sound kind of Pollyannish, but you know, I think I maintain in the book that we all have a higher self, that we have a self that wants to be better. We want to feel empathetic. We want to feel that we're noble. We want to feel that we're basically on the right side of things, that we have the potential to create something great. That, we, that we're disciplined, etc. It's a part of ourselves that, we, that wants to come out. And the ability to actually not just fake your happiness mm -hmm. that someone had some good news, but to actually feel their joy, feel it, is a really make you feel better about yourself and that other person can sense it. So, you know, I've had the personal experience with this. Because I've had some success with my books, obviously, and prior to that, I didn't have much success. So In all 80 jobs? In all 80 jobs. <laughs> wow. I had moderate success, but nothing to write home yeah. about. Wow. Um, so I had suddenly received quite a lot of envy from my friends. And I could sense that rare person when I told them, you know, that I just sold my book or look, it's doing really well. They would actually be really happy for me. They'd be very excited. And I thought, that is a really great human quality. Mm -hmm. That shows, we're talking about character, that shows a generosity of spirit. And you will actually feel better about yourself. Instead of feeling joy in people's pain, you actually either felt empathy for their pain and didn't feel joy, or you actually felt real joy when they're successful. Mm -hmm. You know, so these are things, ways to turn around that envy. I have other ideas. I can't remember them all. That's okay. You don't have to remember all of them. It's okay. The book is 600 pages. Oh, I know. I do remember okay, one do. more. Okay, go ahead. I remember one more. So you think people are doing really well and you're really envious, but if you got closer to them, you'd realize that they're actually as miserable as you are in some ways. I know. I love that you said so, that. It's so true, right? Because yeah. I think that's what, I think that's one of the points that you said that I was like, that's why I kind of smirked when I read through it because... It's true. Like again, like when you when you peel back the layer of anybody, right? Everything always looks. Someone once said to me, "The grass is the grass is always greener until you see their water bill, right?" <laughs> yeah. Because it's true, right? Like it always looks so that beautiful. That applies to LA it, for sure. hundred percent, right? It's an LA at its finest. Yeah. But it's so true. Like everyone always, everything looks nice on the outside. Yeah. You and you never ever know until you get into the intricacies of someone's life, like how it really is. And I know from my own personal experience, it's happened with me a lot where, you know, I'm, I'm no, I'm no, you know, like I'm like everyone else. Like you said, I have envy too. And I, when I, when, whenever I get into a situation where that I'm like close to that human being yeah. for more than three and a half seconds, <laughs> yes. I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so happy yeah, with my right. life. It's the best way to not be envious yeah. anymore yeah. is to actually get close to right. the people that um, you are envious too. But I don't think social media is helping it. Even when we know, I think, um, on a, 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 we, we know that on a more practical, realistic level, that's what's happening. We all know we all post the, the best two sure. seconds, you know, of, of whatever. We don't uh -huh. post the, the fights and the misery and we all mm -hmm. use filters and schmilters. Yeah. And then yet, yeah, even though we know it's all like a ruse, we still feel this way. I know, I know. It's very interesting. Isn't that, why is that? We can't help it. That's the whole point I started in the beginning. We can't help ourselves. We can't. We're animals. We were wired a certain way. We have these forces in it. They're unconscious and they're just triggered. Envy is like a trigger thing in the brain. You can't control it. You put certain circumstances, you hear certain news about people and you're going to feel envy no matter what. Right. And so... You know, the example that we were just talking about that I, th I used in the book was um, Aristotle Onassis oh, was the wealthiest man in the world. How could you not feel envy? He had 12 yachts. He was married to Jacqueline right. Kennedy. He had everything. 
So and true. if you read the story of his life, he was the most miserable son of a bitch that ever. He was so unhappy, and he made everybody else unhappy around him. So, you know, don't go around envying people just because they have money or nice cars or a lot of success. They could be a lot more unhappier than you are. Oh, 100%. And like, that's, that's why I find it inter- That's what I found so interesting is even we, when we know better, we still can't help ourselves. I know. I know. It's a crazy thing. I mean, when you're saying now, you know, when you've had the stroke, I mean, you look at the people who can run, but when you take a step back and look at the people who can't even, you know, walk, right? Yeah. It puts things in perspective. Yeah. I guess having pers- taken that pause and get, gaining some perspective. But it's not easy. It's very exactly. And I know say. it's not easy because I, I feel it every day when I see people running up and down my street. I can but imagine. I have, to, I have to work on it, and I have to run. Instead, of, I, I get that pang of envy, and then I go, "Wait a minute! Remember those other people you've heard about? Remember this person who died? That person who got permanent brain damage? Blah blah blah." So you know. That's it, right. And like I, I mean, and also like you were saying, like when you had that, when you've had the success now after Forty Eight Laws of Power, your life basically changed. How did you respond when you saw people who didn't give you the time of day, right? All of a sudden, they're like nice to your face. They love you. They want to be involved. They'll listen to anything you have to say now. Well, it usually was the opposite. To be honest with you, it what real? I would think the envy was like, peep friends. We're suddenly like, oh, the 48 Laws of Power, what an ugly book. I didn't realize Robert was like that. Oh, he's just, he's just selling out. He's just trying to make money. How are you, you selling know? out? How is that a sellout of a book? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You know, I mean, so, you know, I received the other end of it. But I didn't let that, I, I can be honest, some, I can admit my own negative qualities, and I'm happy to do that. But on that level, I, was, I, I understood I understood where they're coming from because one of the chapters in the 48 Laws of Power is about envy. It's right. called Never Appear Too Perfect. Right. If you're too perfect, people are going to hate you and they're going to envy you. I understand it, so I don't take it personally. Right. I do wish my friends were more generous, but I understand why they're not because I've felt that first, my feeling before as well. That's the point that we started with our conversation was if you understand yourself, you're in a better place to understand other people. Right. So if you understand that you are prone to envy and why you're prone to envy, when other people are doing that towards you, you can be a little more forgiving. You can, first of all, you can recognize the signs of envy because they're very hidden and hard to discern. But also you can understand people and maybe not get angry or resentful about it. Right, because you say a lot that a lot of it has to do with how people respond to you. A lot of it's because of their own baggage. Don't take it so personally. Right. It's, not about, it's not about you. Right. It's about them and how, what's happened with them in their life. Right. Right. But in the moment, it's kind of, you know, it's like it, it hits you in a, in a certain way. Why do you think, you know, it, it mostly I think, you know, 48 Laws of Power, it became like a Bible to like the hip hop community, for example. Why do you think, why do you think it hit so hard? Even for, just like, just to stay on that, on, in that, in the, in that, um, in that community, why do you think it became such a big, prolific Bible, so to speak, for the hip hop community? Well, you know, I can't really totally explain it. They would have to explain it, but I've got an idea. You're pretty smart. I think I think you got more than an idea. <laughs> well, it came out at the right time, pretty much the late '90s, and among. Um, artists in the world, nobody was more exploited than African-American musicians historically in the United States. They were in the worst position. They're some of our greatest musicians ever in the history of the United States. Think of all the great jazz greats, right. Miles oh. Davis, John Coltrane, on and on. Right. They were incredibly exploited, even people like Louis Armstrong or Ella Fitzgerald, immensely talented people who you know made decent livings, but they, their money, most of their money went to the to the publishers, to the music business, right? And so hip hop artists in the 90s were beginning to feel this, were beginning to resent it. They began to understand the mechanics of the business and how deeply they were exploited. And it was even getting worse in the 90s with all of the big record labels, kind of conglomerates. That's, that's the worst business of all. Hollywood looks like kindergarten compared to the music industry. Exactly. They are ravenous sharks, so they exploit like hell. And so beginning with people like Tupac, et cetera, a sort of mentality was evolving where we want to own 
our own music. We want to be entrepreneurs. We don't want you to be taking all our money. We could be doing other things, making, having a brand, selling products, starting our own business, but we also want to own some of our music. And so they were beginning to get involved in that element of the business. And people would tell me, God bless his soul because he's no longer with us, Chris Lighty, who was 50 Cent's manager early on and was the manager for a lot of other great artists like P. Diddy. He told me that, you know, when he first got into the music business in, in the mid to late 90s, he was shocked at how ruthless and awful people were. And 50 himself told me that nothing could prepare him. The streets of Southside Queens where he was selling crack, that's a pretty ugly environment. Mm -hmm. But he said it was nothing compared to like Interscope Records, you <laughs> oh, know. God, yes. So the book helped them. It helped them understand these are the laws of power that people use. Get other people to do the work, but always take the credit. Mm -hmm. You know, um, always say less than necessary. Never outshine the master. These were certain things that they could learn, and it would help them navigate this really dangerous environment and understand some of the manipulations that were going on against them. So I think because it came out at that time, it resonated very deeply. So it was sort of a, a bit of luck, you know, the timing was right. Um, if it had come out earlier, they wouldn't have had that kind of resonance. But there are certain things that the hip hop community kind of um, got very excited about, like the movie Scarface mm -hmm. or about Sun Tzu and the Art of War. Right, that's a big one too. Were you a big fan of that book? You've, you've mentioned it. Art of War. Yeah, yeah, very much. So. Yeah. Could you say a bunch of stuff about a few things about that and yeah, and your things? It's a great book. It's a great book. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Yeah. So it's just, I think it resonated with them. It came out at the right time, and I think it kind of gave them a, a roadmap for perhaps how to deal with this sort of shark-infested environment. I oh, oh, go ahead. Well, the only other thing is. I think they appreciated the honesty of the book. You know, a lot of books that are about power, success, they kind of sugarcoat it. Mm -hmm. They kind of go, well, you know, be nice, be generous, blah, 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 blah. And I, I was giving you like a straight shot of whiskey. Yeah. This is what it's really like. And I think that kind of, they appreciated that. Uh, that's why I appreciate it. That, that's why, how many, how many of those 48 laws, how many, how many millions did that one sell? Just that book alone. That's my biggest seller. Biggest seller, <clears throat> it's, right? It's well over two million now okay. in the United States. In the United States, okay. So obviously, me plus two million other people <laughs> obviously <laughs> liked it a lot, right? Because yeah. I think with so many of those points, like you were saying, like don't you know, less is more, right? These yeah. are like it's kind of like the common sense. Sometimes isn't so common, right? Because if you right. talk too much, you blab and blibber, and you say the wrong thing, or you misspeak, right. and it's. It, I, like a lot of it resonates with me and everyone else. Another good one I really like um, was about boldness versus yeah. being timid. Interaction with boldness. Yeah, because if you, if when you, what did you say? When your audacity can be um, fixed with more audacity. Right. But nobody ever, when you're timid, people don't really respect the timid. Or right. how, you, you said it much more eloquently than I just did. But like these things are like these are like. These are just all one-liners or one quote, like one pieces that you can really apply when, in every day-to-day -day life. Right. Right. Are you now like how when you talk to people and like deal with, you're probably sussing out the situation all the time. Like, is how do you not right? Like, it's kind of like you you become like you become like the expert you know, exponential guru of, of our time. Like, how do you not sit here and be like, oh God, this girl's a total dud or this girl's a dum-dum or like, you know, I, like... I try not to do that. I try not to judge people that way because... How do you not though? You know, it's well, human I, nature too. My, my, my goal isn't to like put you in a category. My, my goal is to understand you. So like, you know, if there's somebody, this is not you at all, but if there's somebody who is somewhat insecure, et cetera, I don't want to sit there and go, God, what a drip, what a, I don't know. I was like, what a drip. What, why are they like that? And then I'm, I'm probing, and my, the writer in me is trying to see, what if I were them? What was their childhood like? What was going on behind it? What is the source of their wound, for instance? And then maybe a picture comes into focus where I can understand them on a level, because that sense of understanding them is a much nicer and healthier and more productive feeling than 
oh, they're bad, they're stupid, they're ugly, blah, blah, blah. Because that's not accurate. They are who they are, just like a, an animal or a rock or a plant has a nature. That's who they are. They evolved that way. They built defenses to protect themselves, just like anybody would in, in their circumstances. So it's a better thing to understand them. Not saying that some people are not dangerous or toxic. Believe me, that's all I write about in my books are toxic people. Right. So you can't just be a lamb and embrace and hug everybody. You have to be aware. But even with the Donald Trumps, the Joseph Stalins, the people who are extremely toxic and dangerous, your ability to understand them as opposed to judging them is, gives you power over them. So if you understand that Donald Trump was a deeply wounded child by his parents, that he's actually a really, really insecure person, he's actually like a little crying baby, there's no need to feel intimidated. There's no fe reason to feel fear of him. Look at how many people are intimidated by him. Look about how many people fall under his spell and do his bidding because they're afraid of all his bluster and his anger. Well, what would happen if in the meeting you looked at him and you go, what a weak little defenseless child that guy, kid is. He adapted that way because he never got any love, just like Richard Nixon. You know, and maybe you feel him pity for him, but you're not going to be intimidated. You're not going to get sucked into his drama because you know that's the power that he has over you. And you know that underneath it all is great layers of weakness. Mm -hmm. So your ability to not always judge people and react and get upset and defensive is power, translates into power. So when you understand why someone is toxic, you now have the ability to strategize against them, to take a step back, to do things that, instead of reacting, instead of getting sucked into their drama. So I'm, I want to turn into, I, 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 my, goal, my way of looking at the world is it's all like a great novel that some writer up there put me in, on, in, on earth in some story and I'm observing people and it's all kind of interesting and exciting and I want to figure out who these characters are in my novel. You know, who do you like when you read a book? Who do you like to read? Well, you know, um, I, I read a lot, obviously. Right, so I, write, I read like hundreds of books to write one book. And right away, I can tell if someone, the writer is a narcissist. I hate narcissistic writers who are there to kind of show off, to vent their opinions sort of say, oh, uh, to show their superiority. Can't stand it. And so many writers are like that nowadays. Mm -hmm. So when I find a writer who is interested in the subject, who gets rid of their ego and gets you into the subject, takes you into that world. If you're writing a biography, they take you inside the world of Coco Chanel or of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love that writer. I don't care if they're not the best writer in the world. If they can make me feel that world, if I can feel that they're getting inside of it, and it's a great book. But so many people are like venting their opinions, their judgments, their whiny little bragging or whatever. I can't stand writing like that. Right. And I find it in a lot of books right now. And when I read a book like that, if you ever come to my house, you'll see I'm like big, big X's. And I'm saying, you know, <laughs> F you on the margin. I don't hold back in, in you know, judging them. Right. Kind of exactly. Well, then who, what, Nate, so some of the books that you're reading right now, or some of the, what are your favorite, like top two favorite books? Oh, it's so difficult. I ask it's, difficult questions. You nope. do. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I was a great, my subject I studied in university was classics. Mm -hmm. Greek and Latin, but my specialty was ancient Greek because I'm fascinated <clears throat> with ancient cultures and ancient Greece in particular. And one of the first books I had to read was Thucydides, Thucydides is what we call Thucydides, the Peloponnesian War, history of the Peloponnesian War. And it was the most difficult thing you could read. One paragraph would take me, in Greek, would take me about a week to decipher. Wow. And I got so excited because this writer it has a magnificent style. And then later on, I could read a little bit more, and then I read it in English. It's a magnificent epic book. It's probably one of the greatest pieces of literature ever. Somebody who has the vision of a Machiavelli, who can look clearly at the world as it is, and yet he's relating something that happened, you know, 2,500 years ago. What could be more exciting? And, he's, and, and stylistically, he's... If you ever pay it, it's hard because the translations don't reveal it. But this is a man who had like the most insanely complicated 
insane, insanely disciplined, organized style of writing. I loved it. And it's the kind of writing that I've always aspired to, mm. which is kind of impersonal, where I'm not spouting poetry and trying to impress you. I'm actually trying to make very clear ideas and clear thoughts. Mm -hmm. So that had a big influence on me. And obviously Machiavelli had a big influence on me. Books like The Prince and The Discourses. Mm -hmm. um, he's like a kindred spirit for me. Um, you know, we're, our, our birthdays are around the same date. I feel like there's a kind of animal um, uh, rapport I have with him, his work. Mm -hmm. He's an earthy person. You know, he's really... He he was he was a great seducer. He wrote one of the one of the most wicked, scandalous comedies ever about the Catholic religion. Um, he was just a great poet and writer, and yet he had the clearest mind when it came to analyzing power. And I'm a great admirer of him. If I could meet those two men, I would love to. I mean, I, those are two books I could I could go on and on. About right. That. Any books recently? Any oh. current, per, any current book that you know someone could go on million. Amazon right now, and that basically that you would be like, you know, like of our t of today's time, that you're like, you know, I like this book. If in the self help space or the power space or the human, there are. It's just hard for me to remember. Um, <clears throat> I know, you know, I should, I should, you know, what I should do? I should write these things down. Because people ask me all the time, and I'm never, I never have a good. You answer. never have an answer for I it. I never yet. have a good answer. Right. I mean, there are books that are read, written now that I love. I'm not totally against people nowadays, and there's some great biographies out there. Um, so, what biography do you like? Let's keep it easy. Like, what's what's your favorite of current times in the last ten years? Biography, biography yeah. of, of of a contemporary person or anybody in the past. Um, Anybody in the past that you like that you can recommend right now? Um, <clears throat> well, the book, the one that I read in the, for that book about Coco Chanel was a great, great yeah. book. You like that one? Uh, very much so. That yeah. was a great book. The book that I read for Mar about Martin Luther King in there, which you'll find in my bibliography, is the kind of standard, largest, longest biography of Martin Luther King. is really good. What I like in a biography is you make the person come to life. I can understand their humanity. Mm -hmm. I don't want the saintly version. I don't want the de their devil version. I want to feel what, what it was actually like to be the flesh and blood human being. Of the person, right. And so those two books, um, there's a book about Abraham Lincoln, which I can't remember the title of, which I like a lot. Um, God damn. No, that's good. You gave me a lot. Um, that's perfect. That's a I lot. I just read a, a biography that, this isn't going to resonate with people because it's about a, a, a romantic poet from the 19th century. But man, it was one of the best biographies I've ever read. Really? It's a biography of the poet Coleridge, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Because I'm doing my next book. I was going to ask it you. It tells a lot about... What is of, your next book? My next book is about the sublime. It's oh. something I talk about in this book a little bit. And, um, and it's like a thousand pages. Two volumes, but boy, was it good! Really? Yeah. And that's so. What do you have? The title of your new book is it called Sublime? Or it's called the Law of the, the Laws of the Sublime. No, the law, <laughs> the, the law. law of the Sublime. The Law. Yes. So is this law one like this one law six hundred pages basically? No. <laughs> this book should be more the three to four hundred pages. Oh, one. okay. So it's like a quick read. <laughs> you know, it's basically a quick read. I was looking at like uh, Audible the other day to 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 read one of I think the mastery one of the books that I did not read, and it was like literally twenty nine hours, like twenty nine hours. Which book? I don't. I think well, it my was, book is twenty nine hours. No, I'm just saying um, all of your books. But I'm saying like I read I I actually like I manually read most of these books, but I wanted to knowing that you were coming on, I wanted to be really I wanted to kind of know about about, about all your work and then. It was like a, when I went and to try to download and listen, it was like 29 hour, you know, listen. I'm like, there's, there's not going to be a time when I can listen for 29 hours on anything. Yeah. So I might as well just read it myself. Thank it's, you. Like, it's, just, it's, it's just easier that way. Yeah, you know? I, I, I have a hard time with all, all, all Me too. I don't know how people can like, they don't have that. How, how do you have that much time to like passively listen? Because then you're not, it doesn't penetrate a lot of the times, right? And then you can't go back and, oh, they said that. What, where, what was that quote there? Exactly. I really want to find that one little tiny quote. How are you going? I know now it, they're going to make technology where you can be able to do that probably, 
but not, I mean, for me, I like to write in the book. Right. I like to take notes. Exactly. I like to reference and cross-reference. I'm old school. Though. I'm old school too, though. I mean, we're just dating ourselves. But like, yeah. I mean, there's some great things you can do in Audible when it's an easy, I mean, there's a lot of books I, I love on Audible, but certain things that you really want to pay attention to the detail yeah. and like remember it and like really kind of get it into your like DNA, you have to have like a hard copy of it. I mean, it's good if you're traveling and you don't have to carry 20 books with you. Right. That's about the only use I can see. Well, with your books, you need a whole new suitcase. I mean, literally, I need a whole, just like a book suitcase. Like, this is heavy. I was just, I was just in Mexico for a book tour. And the book is even thicker in Spanish. Oh, God. And I had to carry it around and my, I have kind of hurt my back. Oh, I can imagine. I mean, I could not. Like, it's like, this, it's heavy for me. So then when you wrote The 50th Law with 50 Cent, did he come to you and say, I really want, was he, obviously he was a huge fan of yours. And he says, let's collaborate together. Or like, how did that even? Well, it's not quite as sexy as that. Basically, okay. <laughs> his literary agent, a young man named Mark Gerald, okay. approached me and said, 50 is a huge fan of the 48 Laws of Power. It's his Bible. He would like to meet you. And I go, sure, right. I'd love to. Why not? So I flew to New York and uh, I met him in the back room of a steakhouse on Madison Avenue. And he was with his little, you know, posse entourage. of uh, entourage people who works with. And I was just by myself. I was a little bit intimidated. I didn't know what he would be like. He has this image and everything. Right. I was a little concerned and um, we hit it off really well. You know, sometimes people, you, you never know who you're going to connect with. You never know. Sometimes people that you think you're going to hate or people you're going to love, it, there's no chemistry or energy between them. And I'm not somebody who's attracted to celebrities. I'm actually more interested in taxi drivers or Uber drivers, people's daily lives. I don't really want to hang out with Taylor Swift, to be honest with you. <laughs> you don't? No, I don't. I mean, I have nothing against her. Maybe she's amazing. Maybe you'll do the 51 laws of power with her. I oh, mean, maybe. Yeah. I doubt it. But, but 50 was very real. He, he, I had just written my war book about strategy. And he was, you know, we were talking about strategies in his life and his career. And we just had a nice kind of uh, energy, synergy together. Right. And... Um, and I think it was it was mutual. He could feel comfortable with me because he knew that I'm not like someone who's like in love with celebrity. I'm just, you know, a normal was, person, a normal person. He wasn't what I he wasn't what I was expecting because he was much nicer and very sweet and actually a gentle person. And I wasn't what he was expecting. He was expecting some kind of shriveled Henry Kissinger type <laughs> who's really maniacal and power hungry. So we were both kind of shocked and surprised. And then I came away from that going, you know, you couldn't imagine two more different people in the United States of America, where he grew up on the streets of Southside Queens and me, a middle-class Jew from Los Angeles. <laughs> oh, you know, yes. what, 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 what could be more different? Yeah. And what could be more exciting than to bring our two brains together to create a book and to create something, to bring our two ways of looking at the world you know, that to me is the greatness of America, that we, that we have incredible commonalities. And instead of talking about all about focusing on differences, let's talk about what makes my very different world from your very different world. What are the similar things? Mm -hmm. Why we both became obsessed with strategy, why we're both very interested in, in, in power, for instance. So I thought, he's an inspired, I spend my life with dead people, Napoleon, <laughs> Louis Fourteenth. <laughs> and here I have a chance to be with someone who's actually living and breathing and has blood throwing through their veins. Right. <laughs> Why not write a book about with him about our ideas about fear and sort of weaving in stories about his life and lessons from his life about what can happen to you if you have no fear. And that's sort of what the book is about. I have a question. You know, we're talking about laws of power. His agent called you because he wanted to meet you, but you flew to New York. Why didn't he fly to L.A.? Well, um, you know, I love New York. I lived in New York for many years. So any excuse to oh, hop on okay. JetBlue. <laughs> I like go, JetBlue. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and go stay at uh, the Bowery Hotel. Back then, it didn't exist. I don't know where I was staying back then. But, you know, I love New York. Right, I like so, it. So um, there's more having to do with that. Than anything else. You know else. what? Come out to L.A. isn't his environment. It's not who he is. 
it's, it's, it, there's you know, fifty cent in L.A. just doesn't feel the same. Right, right, right. So you, so that, how did that book sell? It sold well too, though. It sold right? very well. Very. Not, it's my shortest book, but it's the shortest book. Right, but you didn't sell. You didn't sell two. How many copies of that one did you sell? Oh, you're getting to that. Yeah, I'm well, curious. We sold like three hundred fifty thousand copies. That's still really good. I mean, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Wow. Are you? And so, are you guys still really close friends? Did you hang well, out and? Well, we don't hang out, but we talk to each other every few months, and he's he's considering maybe turning the fiftieth law into a television series. So we've been discussing that. Oh, that would be nice for you. Yeah. Isn't it funny how things come full circle? You used to, you know, in your what in one of your eighty jobs, you were working in Hollywood, you know, as something else, right? And now you might come back to Hollywood with something else. Like so it came like full circle. I know. And right now we're, you know, what Quibi is. Of course, I know what Quibi is. Yeah. Well, we're we're maybe. I shouldn't say of course. Yes, I know what Quibi is. Okay, yeah. so. We might be doing the 48 Laws of Power as a series for Quibi, where it looks like they're, they're giving the green light. That's amazing. But I, I can't say for sure, you know. Yeah, knock so on wood. Oh, that would be um, great. Well, we'll see. I'm surprised. I mean, Jeffrey have... Katzenberg signed off, and whatever that means. It means a lot. So that's funny. And, Jeff, Jeff, and Jeffrey Katzenberg, there's a whole story about him and, and Michael Eisner. I hope he's read it, yeah. Because he, he comes out well. I have nothing against Jeffrey no, Katzenberg. No, I mean, he came out perfect. Yeah. It, was not, it was all about Michael Eisner. It yeah. wasn't about him. Michael yeah. Eisner, like, you know, got jealous, so, basically, yeah. of him and yeah. kicked him out, and then he made a fortune because of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he should be. Re- you should be giving this to him. He'll for sure do the. I green will. Light. I will definitely do that. I'll underline the passages about it. A hundred percent, you yeah. should. Um, well, I think that. I mean, I've kept you for like I think how long has it been? Like five hours already. <laughs> Is <Close>. it okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, you I, haven't. You haven't reached Joe Rogan territory yet. I haven't yet. But Joe I could. Rogan keeps you in there for three hours. <laughs> I mean, how many bathroom breaks do you get in three hours? I don't remember. I can't remember because it was like five years ago. But I'm surprised you didn't go back on there for human nature. It's up to him. He's 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 a he's an interesting animal who's got his own tastes. Maybe the book was too long. He doesn't like to read. A friend of mine, Ryan Holiday, actually told me that the only book he has ever read is the Forty Eight Laws of Power. Are you serious? Yeah. He's not, I mean, he's a great guy. He's really smart. He's an f- incredibly funny comedian. Yeah, he's and very he's talented with that. Very talented, yeah. great interviewer, but he's not a big reader, although he interviews writers, etc. Const- yeah, they have to see to see if Cole's notes for all the writers that come on. I don't know. I don't know his secret. I hate to say it because maybe I'm wrong, but that's what Ryan told me. So it gave me the idea that he doesn't. Right. I was on his book, show for Mastery, but I don't know. If oh, he- I thought it was for Forty Eight Laws of Power. It wasn't no. even for that. Yeah. For mastery, yeah. but you make the circuit. I see you everywhere. You're like doing everybody's <laughs> podcast and media oh thing. God. Yeah, it's like the Borscht Belt. I was going <laughs> to say, like the Borscht Belt. People don't know what that is. I know what that is, but still. Yeah. Uh, well, can I? Can I have? I'll either come to you or you can come to me. But I want to do a whole other one on the Forty Eight Laws sure, of Power, sure. or the and the sedu- I mean, on every one of them. Because I felt like I felt kind of you like you can move into my house. I sure. <laughs> <laughs> to an extra bedroom, I'll be more than happy to, because the truth is, like I did, I like, I got like, I got some anxiety because I'm like, I have so many things, and like I have notes scattered from this book and from that book, and I'm like, how am I going to condense it all in like an hour? Because like I said, like most people have one book, and it's like an easy thing, whatever. You have like a hundred, you know, eleven of like masterpieces. So only six, but they'll take the okay. Yeah. Eleven when you count how big they are. Okay, okay. they're like doubles. Okay, okay. it's like a, a double thing. Um, so yeah, and so thank you so much. I really loved oh, no. having thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. You you organized all of your scattered notes very well. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you, and I, good luck with the Quibi thing. How are we gonna? When is it gonna happen for sure? Or maybe well, we know? Um, I just found out earlier this week. I've been dealing with trying to turn the 48 laws into something for 13 years. I know how things in Hollywood are mm-hmm. like, you know, slip through your fingers like quicksand, quicksilver. Yep. So I'm not, you know, I hardly say that it's for sure. But I think we'll know in the next couple of weeks. Um, there's a, a particular individual who's behind it who's kind of famous. Oh, that well, kind of, is it Jay-Z? No. Is it 50 Cent? No. Is it... Beyonce? No. no. Okay. Is it Kanye West? No. Okay, who is it? Drake. Drake's behind it? 
Yeah, well, it's his company that's trying. Oh, I love drinking. First of all, I'm Canadian, so was he. Oh, you are? Yes. I'm You're from Canadian. Toronto? I'm from Toronto. Yes. So you can yeah. understand. You know he's half Jewish. Of course I know he's half Jewish. He lived I, in four. I know, believe me, I know everything about I, that I, kid. I met him and we, we had, he interviewed me for, I don't know, for, for what. And we were, I've, all we talked about was our bar mitzvahs. Really? Did you know that, J, that Drake was bar mitzvah? Of course I know. He, oh. First of all, Drake grew up in Forest Hill, which is an area where I know very well. He was on a show called Degrassi Junior High, yeah, yeah. right? So I knew Drake before Drake was, I knew who he was before Drake became became Drake. Uh-huh. He's like a nice Jewish boy from Toronto. Yeah, I'm like, he's not... There's another side to him. He's I was gonna say totally when Jewish. I say it, I was gonna say he's not really a nice Jewish boy from Toronto, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. he's behind this project. Well, yes, he 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 started a film company, and he works with Anonymous Content, the company, mm-hmm. and his company and Anonymous, they're the people behind it. I'm sure yeah. he's a well. Wasn't he a huge another one? Of, he's a huge. He's fan He's a of huge fan of the 48 Laws of yeah. Power because it really helped him as well. You know, he's he, he can testify to how ruthless and awful the music business is and he's when it comes to suffering from envy and bit and you know bitter rivalries in the music business he has a lot of stories oh you know what i'll tell you something i was going to say it earlier i used to work in the music business so oh. when i was in canada I, I used to be at bmg music and so i moved out to la to work for a record label i got approached by a different record label and that, I was going to say that business is, you're right, it makes Hollywood look like a kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, very cutthroat. But yeah. it's changed now. It it's, is. It's, it's not, not the same anymore. It's not the same. I really actually don't know because, I, I mean, I don't have much contact with the business. I mean, Drake would tell stories. So I don't know in the last five or six years if, if things have really gotten smoother or softer. But actually, some things haven't changed where... How do you make money in the music business now? It's very difficult. Oh. And you're either on the cream of the crop, you know, the top 20 artists, or you're really struggling. Mm-hmm. That huge middle zone that used to exist doesn't exist anymore. I know. So it's still pretty, it's a pretty dog eat dog environment. It is. And you know what's interesting? Like, and most of the time, other people own you, they own yeah. the rights to you, they own the license to you. And even with all these shows that are, you know, it's entertainment, like the, what do you call it, The Voice and this one, and that one. The, very rarely do those, even with all that exposure, those people don't become stars very rare. Like very, no. very rarely does it happen. And if they're a star, six months later, we don't, never heard You've of them. You've never heard of them. They may have one hit. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. So how do you even become like, it's, it's unbe- even with all those millions of people watching you, it's still yeah. not enough to penetrate the market. And even if you do penetrate it, it's still like, what do you, how do you build on that success? Yeah. How do you keep it going? So you tell me, you're the smart one here. I don't know. I'm, um, I have an interview this Sunday. You know who Rick Ross is? Of course I do. He's interviewing me on Sunday for his show. He has a podcast. I love how you're doing all, you're doing the whole <laughs> hip hop community. It's like, it's like, like you said, middle class Jewish boy, you know, it's like you're going from like one hip hop artist to another. Yeah. That's hilarious. Well, he's, he's had a very tre- checkered, difficult life. You yeah. Know? You know, I don't he know also that... suffered a lot of health issues, et cetera. And he has a book that came out a few months ago that's on the bestseller list. Which book? It's called Hurricanes. It's his biog- autobiography. He's a, he's really huge in, in like in, in that space though. Yeah. He's really really big. Is he like a he does a, he's a big producer though too, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. Did you ever did you ever meet with Jay Z? Because I know like no 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 yet. I wanted to. I mean I know he's a big fan of the yeah. Birds. How come you never met him? I don't know. I mean we've wanted to. I've had I've sent books to his manager. His manager is a huge fan, and I've connect contact with yeah. him. Yeah, and nothing. No, I once sat on a JetBlue flight from New York to LA with um, with God, her name just slipped my mind. Not Taylor Swift, obviously. No, 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 no. Um, um, Beyonce. Solange. Oh, Solange. Beyonce's no. sister. They hate each other, though, don't they? Don't they have like don't a know. big rivalry? Do they? No, Solange. Didn't Solange? Like beat him up in an elevator. One yeah, time. With, she has. She doesn't get along with Jay Z. I didn't know she didn't get along with Beyonce. No, no, no. no. I'm talking about her and Jay Z. Yeah, I yeah. don't think they get along. Right. That's the closest I've ever gotten. <laughs> that how is that possible? If he's a big fan, I don't know. Um, all right, so I guess we'll wrap this up because it's been uh, almost now. It's going to get into like Joe Rogan time yeah, here, right? Yeah. Like two hours later. <laughs> um, all right, so 
Robert, first of all, like as you can tell, as I gush over you, this has been amazing to have you on the podcast. People can uh, pick up the laws of human nature if you are strong enough. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> you can find it on Amazon or tell us, tell us where they can find you if they want to know more about the insights of you. Well, I have an old website that we've kept together. It's called powerseductionandwar.com. The and is spelled out, powerseductionandwar.com. And there you'll find links to my other books, The 50th Law, Mastery, and The New Book. It's, you know, it's a... New Book being The Laws of Human Nature. Yes. Okay. And you'll find links to all my podcasts. They're too numerous. To, to, to name. <laughs> uh, and there's even a place where you can write me your nasty thoughts about my <laughs> books or how awful I am. And um, that's probably the best place. All my books are available on Amazon. You know, so... If you can't find my books, it's not my fault. I was going to say, it's probably not your fault. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me, Jim. My pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Habits and hustle. Time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind. Don't stop. Keep it going. Habits and hustle from nothing into something. All out. Hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries. Tune in. You can get to know them. Be inspired. This is your moment. Excuses. We ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle Podcast. Powered by Habit Nest.